This lecture is about several things. Uh, first of all, uh, at the theoretical level, it is about the theory of value and how it works uh, under capitalism. Secondly, it's also about freedom. What kind of freedom people have under capitalism and how it is linked with this theory of value that I'm going to describe in this lecture. And finally, I will also address the question of transition. The question of transition from capitalism to a higher form of society, if possible. I will argue that it has become necessary to think seriously about this transition, given the crisis that the world now faces. Uh, but uh, it is a question of some importance uh, whether such a transition will be possible on this planet or not. So, uh, with those words, let me launch into the first part, uh, uh, the theoretical part uh, about the theory of value. Uh, a lot of work has been done, a lot of ink has been spilled, a lot of controversies have taken place uh, without seemingly much resolution. One might even say that it has been more voluminous than luminous. There has been certainly a lot more heat than light. Uh, my purpose is not to contribute to the heat so much as to shed some light by making initially an important distinction between two different approaches to the theory of value. People familiar with classical political economy would know that uh, the theory of value really served uh, uh, two purposes. One purpose was to uh, uh, determine how prices or exchange values were fixed in capitalism with a market system, especially a competitive market system. The second, and this is something that I want to emphasize more during my talk and relate it to uh, real concrete problems of transition, uh, is about the allocation of social labor to different branches of social production and reproduction. Uh, in this sense, uh, labor or labor power, as uh, uh, Marx correctly called it, uh, is one of the key aspects of social production and reproduction, especially of the economy. Um, and uh, uh, the way uh, social labor is allocated uh, ultimately determines uh, the rate of technological progress, the creation of wealth, uh, the rapidity with which uh, wealth is uh, created, etc. Uh, I will argue that uh, in the traditional approach to the labor theory of value, um, the first aspect has received too much emphasis and because it has received too much emphasis, it has often led to useless controversies. Uh, uh, it is a good question historically whether uh, uh, Marx really intended his labor theory of value to be a theory of price. Um, uh, I will leave that aside. Um, uh, there are certainly uh, interesting points to be made uh, here and has been made by many people and it is a very interesting and at times exciting debate but uh, uh, often it really uh, leads us into fruitless dead ends as well. Uh, I'm not interested uh, during this lecture uh, about the theory of price uh, but I'm much more interested in the allocation of labor power and ultimately uh, the development of social individuality of human beings uh, uh, and how it relates uh, both to capitalism and uh, uh, possible uh, transitions away from capitalism into higher forms of society. In order to do that, I will make this initial distinction then between what might be called the quantitative theory of value and a different version, a qualitative theory of value. Both of them actually are there in, in Marx uh, especially, uh, but not uh, both have been developed equally well. Uh, I will not uh, bore the listener with uh, a litany of uh, 
uh, who did what and when and how and who did what wrong and what right, uh, except as it becomes necessary uh, to mark some crucial points uh, uh, in the history of the debate. Uh, my focus is more on the applicability of uh, this theory and uh, further development of this theory to the crucial problems uh, that I mentioned before. So to begin with, the famous transformation problem has its origins in volume three of Capital, and the various controversies it generated would easily fill several volumes. Without rehearsing these, I want to emphasize that the transformation problem is not simply about how to get to prices of production from labor values. It is also, and more fundamentally, about how the rate of profit is determined in a competitive capitalist economy. Recent developments in formalizing this approach show that prices of production and the rate of profit are determined simultaneously. Marx's famous formula for the definition and calculation of the average rate of profit is, therefore, not generally valid, although it is an interesting first attempt uh, much better, I would say, than Ricardo's was um, in uh, disentangling uh, the various problems um, uh, of value and prices. There are some special cases for which Marx's formulation is still correct. And I will leave it at that. And I will not pursue the many interesting questions, both exegetical and theoretical, that can be raised within the quantitative approach. Suffice it to say that these questions and theoretical problems constitute legitimate areas of research in the theory and history of political economy. And thriving research programs certainly exist, mainly outside of the mainstream social sciences. Among other things, the pace and rhythm of accumulation of capital and capital theory in general can be formulated in a much more meaningful and conceptually rigorous way within this tradition than the neoclassical school. Instead of seeing it primarily as a theoretical tool for pursuing questions of determination of prices of production, the rate of profit, or The rhythm of capital accumulation, the labor theory of value can be given a qualitative interpretation as I mentioned before. Here, the basic question is the following. Why does the value form arise under capitalism? Why does the value form arise under capitalism? We can see after thinking about this question for a while, that in order to pose the problem correctly, we will need to go beyond the use value versus exchange value distinction of classical political economy. A clarification of the basic theoretical issues involved in the qualitative labor theory of value will also help us pose a number of other difficult problems in a way that will allow some progress to be made. I will illustrate two such sets of problems. First, what is the connection between alienation under capitalism and the value form? In many Marxian exegetical exercises and theoretical developments, most notably in Althusser's and his followers' works, a distinction is made between the early or young philosophical humanist Marx and later scientific political economist Marx. Without going into specific details about how valid this interpretation of specific texts of Marx is, I will argue that such a distinction is misleading theoretically in that it misses a deep connection between the political economy of capitalism and the ontological problems of human subjectivity under capitalism. I will elaborate on this later. A second related issue 
is the problem of transition away from capitalism to a classless, non-exploitative society. Here, I will try to show that the qualitative labor theory of value approach helps us to raise a set of questions that have to do with the abolition of value form, wage labor, and the overcoming of alienation as problems of liberating labor as the fundamental life activity by freeing it from the shackles of capitalist production and other oppressive social relations. So this distinction is really crucial between labor as a fundamental life activity, which you find clearly stated in early Marx, especially in the uh, uh, economic and philosophical manuscripts, uh, but also in other works like German ideology um, and uh, alienation. Uh, 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 when you have just labor power, which is hired out, uh, which uh, uh, has the form of wage labor uh, under capitalism uh, and has other alienated forms uh, in other oppressive class societies. We will be able to see also that a struggle for liberation of labor is essentially political and the liberation of labor actually can fundamentally be seen as the liberation of all of humankind. And therefore, political economy um, really always had a very crucial role, crucial analytical as well as axiological role to play uh, in uh, radical political economy. Uh, and uh, that role is not vitiated uh, by what uh, has happened uh, in terms of work on ideology, work on subjectivity uh, by many important thinkers uh, uh, in the last few decades. And towards the end of my talk, I will try to link some of these, especially the work of Foucault uh, uh, with uh, political economy considerations. Politics, though, has to be redefined as a broad struggle not just for state power, but an all-around struggle to abolish all oppressive relations of domination in every sphere of social life. Such a struggle constitutes the basic strategic aspect of emancipation from class society. An important aspect in abolishing wage labor as a relation of economic domination, according to the theory I will present, will turn out to be the equalizing of social capabilities. Sen is uh, famous for coming up with the idea of capabilities. Uh, uh, Nussbaum has given it Aristotelian interpretation and foundations. And in some of my earlier work, I have tried to give it a completely social uh, foundation. And I have called, therefore, capabilities social capabilities, although social here is linked clearly uh, and can be linked clearly uh, with uh, individuals and that is another way in fact for us to think of individuals as social individuals not just isolated atomistic entities so uh, these social capabilities aspects uh, and their development uh, would require a set of progressive economic and social policies and their also is the opening that ties struggles for reforms under capitalism with revolutionary activities. So instead of being very ultra left and saying that uh, uh, the hell with capitalism, uh, uh, we have to be very focused on what kind of struggles are necessary under capitalism, what kind of reforms we can fight for uh, so that we can build links of solidarity, we can build even in the present movement, the movement for a future without exploitation and class relations. Such a move will necessitate the formation of new and radically different forms of social life through the struggle in the present movement, as I just mentioned. The theoretical key lies in grasping the alienating aspects of abstract labor under capitalism. Such an understanding leads to asking seriously the question, what are the requirements for labor not to be abstract, but 
the free life affirming activity of social individuals. Here, the connections between Marx's ethics and Aristotelian eudaimonism, drawn by Alan Gilbert, for example, support and are supported by my approach to the theory of qualitative labor theory of value. So here is a quick theoretical formulation. First of all, uh, it is uncontroversial, I hope, to point out that the main objective of capital, and here I quote, was to explain the origin and development of the capitalist economic formation in terms of the developing relationships between men as producers. This is a direct quote from Ronald Meek, uh, and he uses the word men. Today we probably would use uh, a, a less sexist term. Uh, and in his magisterial survey of the origins and significance of the labor theory of value, Meek further went on to add, and I quote again, it had to be shown in the case of both of commodity production in general and of capitalist commodity production in particular, that a definite form of production determines the forms of consumption, distribution, exchange, and also the mutual relations between these various elements." End of quote. In this demonstration, the labor theory of value evidently played a key role since it is in effect, I quote again, a particular way of stating that social relations of production determine relations of exchange. This is certainly a methodologically correct and scientifically fruitful way of proceeding. And I will explore this further following the path of inquiry opened up first by the Russian theorist I.I. Rubin. However, I would like to uh, push a bit the scope of Capital, Marx's uh, most important scientific work in his lifetime, and the labor theory of value further. As Engels correctly stated in his speech on Marx's gravesite, Marx was first and foremost a revolutionary. Losing sight of this fact can lead one to treat Marx's work as only an academic attempt to understand capitalism. Although there is nothing wrong with academic attempts to understand capitalism or the fractal nature of snowflakes or whatever, in Marx's case, such an interpretation limits the scope of his most important scientific work unnecessarily. Surely, Marx wanted to analyze capital as a social relation and to a large degree succeeded in understanding capitalism from a scientific point of view. However, and more importantly, he also wanted to contribute politically to the project of overcoming capital. What Marx said of science in general, that it is always critical and revolutionary, critical and revolutionary, applies with particular force to Marx's approach to the political economy of capitalism. I want to argue that following this line of thought with respect to the qual qualitative labor theory of value will show this theory to be indeed both critical and revolutionary, especially revolutionary. The political project that emanates from a fully developed qualitative labor theory of value is nothing other than that of overcoming capital. In 1850, writing about class struggles in France, Marx had already declared, and I quote, this socialism is the declaration of the permanence of the revolution, the class dictatorship of the proletariat as the necessary transit point to the abolition of class distinctions generally, to the abolition of all the relations of production on which they rest to the abolition of all the social relations that correspond to these relations of production, to the revolutionizing of all the ideas that result from these social relations. So there are really four abolitions here that are involved, uh, uh, linking um, uh, the 
relations of production all the way to ideas and, and, and vice versa in a truly dialectical manner. So, how does an understanding of qualitative labor theory of value help us in understanding why and how an all-around class struggle must be waged to overcome all oppressive political, economic, and social relations under capitalism. And, as I will shortly explain, under the Soviet or Chinese varieties of socialism that existed in the 20th century. And furthermore, we also have to conclude that all ideas based on these class relations, these exploitative relations, also must disappear. I take as my starting point the discussion of the twofold nature of value and commodity fetishism in the chapter on commodities in Capital, Volume 1. Here, of course, Marx is trying to deal with the appearances on forms of exchange under capitalist relations of production. However, Marx's method of presentation is intended only to lead the reader from this realm of appearances to the realm of deeper causal relations obscured by these appearances. Therefore, in contrast with the already appearing vulgar theories of exchange and the currently fashionable price and value theory of the neoclassical school, Marx posits abstract labor as the substance of value. To Marx, it was clear that the allocation of labor in social production among different branches of production was a natural requirement for the, rep for the reproduction of the economy and society. Marx attempted uh, uh, such a, a theoretical description and Marx accepted uh, uh, this natural requirement of for the reproduction of the economy and society uh, as an axiom for his theory, one might even say. As he stated clearly in his letter to Kugelmann in July 1868, and here I quote again, that this necessity of distributing social labor in definite proportions cannot be done away with by the particular form of social production but can only change the form it assumes is self-evident. No natural laws can be done away with. What can change in changing historical circumstances is the form in which these laws operate. In this same letter, Marx repeats his point from the first chapter of Capital Volume 1 that exchange value as a social form appears and I quote again, in a state of society where the interconnection of social labor is manifested in the private exchange of the individual products of labor. So it is a society where individual producers are of necessity isolated and they can only validate the social nature of their labor through exchange in the market. Therefore, market really plays a crucial role in this kind of exchange value based society. In his seminal contribution, Rubin makes a general claim about Marx's political economy with which Marx's claim about the exchange value form is completely consistent. And I quote here from Rubin. Political economy which deals with the production relations among people in the commodity capitalist economy presupposes concrete economic formation of society. We cannot correctly understand a single statement in Marx's capital if we overlook the fact that we are dealing with events which take place in a particular society. And of course, for Rubin as for Marx, this particular society was a capitalist society based on allocation of labor power, which has become wage labor and means of production, which have become capital as social relation between uh, the capital owning or controlling class and the laboring classes. And uh, uh, furthermore, commodities can circulate only 
at the sphere of exchange. They are not directly produced for consumption. Therefore, for a scientific explanation of the exchange value form, capitalist production relations are the essential underlying causal relations. In particular, abstract labor as a conceptual category is necessitated by the need for a realist explanation of exchange value. The conceptualization of abstract labor as being constituted by the concrete relations of production under capitalism is the key to resolving the paradox Marx had already posed in the 1850s. Here, Marx says, on the one hand, commodities must enter the exchange process as objectified universal labor or labor time. On the other hand, the labor time of individuals becomes objectified universal labor time only as a result of the exchange process. Much misunderstanding exists surrounding this point. Uh, um, uh, there is no abstract labor theory of value that exists independently of the market exchange process. The market exchange process, in fact, validates the social nature of production and socially necessary labor time that is used in production. Rubin, therefore, correctly pointed out that production for exchange, and we might add for profits to be realized through exchange, leaves its imprint on the production process itself. This imprint of necessity is one of control over labor by capital. Although I should uh, hasten to ask that uh, uh, it is never free from struggle between capital and labor and uh, uh, the whole history of capitalism concretely is an expression of such struggles and periodic concessions by capital to labor and also periodic uh, attacks by capital on labor as uh, we have seen especially in the last uh, 30, 40 years. It cannot then simply be the case, as even some well-meaning critics such as John Robinson have maintained, that nothing in Marx's system depends on the labor theory of value. Quite to the contrary, almost everything does. In particular, a mature political economy-based explanation of alienation and a revolutionary critique of capital that points to the way of abolishing capital as a social relation would have to be abandoned if the qualitative labor theory of value is jettisoned. The only part, and this too is controversial, of Marx's project that can be safely abandoned is the derivation of prices, not just prices of production, from value. But this may not even have been the main goal of Marx to begin with. What we need to do at this point, then, is to develop qualitative labor theory of value farther in order to show that, first of all, quality, qualitative labor theory of value is a deep scientific explanation for alienation and exploitation under capitalism. And secondly, that qualitative labor theory of value can elucidate the requirements for transition from capitalism towards a classless society. It is to these two tasks that I now turn. First of all, I want to uh, draw a connection between eudaimonism as an ethical approach, uh, most concretely in the form of social capabilities and alienation. If labor is rendered abstract under capital, it is not simply because exchange equalizes social labor. Prior to exchange, in the very relation established by the circuit of productive, product, productive, productive capital, which is described by Marx in great detail in Capital Volume 2, edited by Engels, of course. So prior to exchange, in the very relation established by the circuit of productive capital and the hiring of wage laborers, capital, which is dead labor in the monetary form faces living labor, not as specific individual lives, but as 
general capacity for work or as abstract labor power. Furthermore, under the laws of capitalist production, the worker faces domination in workplace, which is quite independent from whether surplus value is produced or not. Even if surplus value is produced and distributed to the workers, say for example, under a profit sharing scheme, the domination of capital over labor will still exist as long as technical division of labor within the enterprise continues to be accompanied by a hierarchical and non-democratic, non-participatory management system. Under normally functioning capitalism, of course, equal share in the profits of the enterprise is not the case. But this limiting case illustrates clearly what is wrong with the quantitative formulation of exploitation only as the rate of surplus value. Even if the rate of surplus value is zero, there can still be exploitation in the very quality of the production relations themselves. This qualitative relational type of exploitation is conceptually quite close to both Marx's early concept of alienation and Alan Gilbert's emphasis on the, the underlying Aristotelian aspects of three central features of this concept in Marx. In early Marx, the problem is motivated by a conception of the species being of humans. Under capitalist conditions of production, the potential to be human qua a, number, qua a member of this unique species is thwarted. Of course, it is only much later, after the publication of Darwin's work, that Marx would see the specific natural historical connections between evolution and human potential. But the celerity with which Marx grasped the strengths of Darwin's theory while avoiding the crass and false social Darwinism of the Victorian intellectuals suggests that his conceptions were quite consistent with a naturalistic view of life that accorded proper importance to the constraints of social institutions historically in human development. It is only within the social, political, and economic institutions of capitalism that the concept of the proletariat makes any sense. And theoretically, the concept of proletariat embodies in a radical form the complete alienation that occurs under the conditions of wage labor. Dialectically, the proletariat also carries the potential to oppose and finally to overcome capital, a potential that we will discuss more fully soon. If we turn now to the interesting thesis that Marx was an Aristotelian in his critique of alienation, it can be seen that such a conception of the theory of alienation supports the emphasis on the qualitative labor theory of value that I am presenting here. Gilbert, for example, points out that in some parts of capital, Marx, and I quote here, compared productive, productive activity in general with labor under capitalism in a purely Aristotelian way, end of quote. Marx's characterization of Milton's labors on the paradise lost as self-motivated, non-alienated labor, and his contrast of such labor with that of a hack writer who writes only for the money he receives from the capitalist publisher underlines the good of genuine life-affirming labor. Ironically, in real life under capitalism and in bourgeois political economy, Milton's labor is unproductive while the hack is a productive wage laborer. In Capital, Marx shows how the accumulated dead labor in the form of means of production, which become capital, dominates workers. Workers are mere means of further accumulation. Under the sign of capital, death dominates over life and denies the workers the necessary opportunity to realize their potential to be free, creative beings. As Gilbert points out, 
Marx's seemingly non-moral starting point of analyzing commodities ultimately leads to a moral critique of capital as a social relation. Qualitative labor theory of value implies such a moral critique as well. In particular, going beyond abstract labor means recognizing the use value exchange value distinction as emerging in a historically specific alienated and alienating mode of production. Going beyond such a distinction ultimately means going beyond value form itself or rather a transvaluation of values that can result from a transformation of capitalist social relations in the kind of revolution, revolutionary way that Marx in uh, 1850 already had grasped. So taking the qualitative labor theory of value as the central explanatory framework and connecting it with eudaimonism can also help illuminate Foucault's important and insights about the societies of discipline and control that form a part of his critique of modernity. From this point of view, such developments are consistent with the reproduction of the value form under the domination of capital. Foucault shows how the discipline of the army served as the model for discipline in the factory. In fact, for Foucault, virtually every institution is permeated with this disciplinary mode of functioning until a more subtle and manipulative system of control can be developed. Foucault's concept of biopower is a particularly powerful way of characterizing how the production and reproduction of life itself can become an object of control under capitalism. In Discipline and Punish, Foucault analyzes in detail how the human body itself can be objectified. The fundamental goal of disciplinary power was to create a docile body. At the same time, this docile body also needed to be a productive body. Looked at from the perspective of qualitative labor theory of value, this implies nothing less than the total alienation of flesh and spirit. Once again, the problem from the human point of view in spite of the ironically avowed anti-humanism of early Foucault, then becomes how to overcome this alienation. We now turn to this problem. If, as I have argued so far, the abolition of alienation requires the abolition of capital as a social relation of domination, can qualitative labor theory of value throw any light on how to abolish capital as a social relation? This is the important question that we have to discuss now. The classical political economists posed the problem of creating both wealth and freedom in a clear fashion. In Smith's formulation, the objective theory of value was also to facilitate an objective measure of wealth that, in his view, was a prerequisite for creating a civilized society beyond the rude state that characterized the human societies until the advent of capitalism. As a moral philosopher, Smith also advanced normative claims regarding the superiority of capitalism over previous modes of production. The overcoming of feudalism and the restrictions imposed by such an order on individual freedom by a transition to capitalism created further prospects for the development of free individuals. 18th century liberalism embodied such prospects as an intellectual system. Yet, as Polanyi and others have documented, the advent of capitalist free market turned out to be at least partly illusory. It was precisely during the heydays of classical liberalism that Polanyi's famous double movement developed with all the flair and human drama of an age of contradictions. On the one hand, capital moved aggressively to commodify everything. On the other hand, working class and democratic struggles kept breaking out, 
leading to restrictions on capital's moves towards self-expansion, self-expansion and self-aggrandizement. In the 20th century, through world wars and revolutions, the project of breaking away from capitalism seemed to have started, only to meet its demise at the end of the century. Is the qualitative labor theory of value of any use in understanding the dramatic history that reveals Polanyi's double movement? If it is, then how is one to interpret these events and movements in the light of qualitative labor theory of value? Logically, the development of qualitative labor theory of value requires the presence of struggle at the point of production. Therefore, it is consistent with the theory of double movement. Still, if struggles are to be conceived only at the sites of production, then a larger politics of the workers and their allies involving the goal of seizing power and transforming this world seems to be precluded. Hence, either a broadening of qualitative labor theory of value consistent with its original premises seem to be called for, or we have to abandon the project of linking the value theory with human liberation. The stakes are indeed quite high, and I want to explore the first alternative. However, it will turn out that this broadening is inconsistent with Marx's view of socialism as developed in his famous critique of Gotha program. The central question from the perspective of our theory, it may be recalled, is not the determination of prices, but rather the existence of the value form as such. It could be argued then that the transition away from capitalism towards a higher form of society ultimately requires the abolition of wage labor, and therefore also the value form. Forms of exchange may and probably will exist in such a society, but the extraction of value from living labor and nature by discipline and control, in the specific sense developed in Foucault's writings in particular, will no longer be necessary. Clearly, between such a society of the future and the present society of exploitation, there will be an entire historical epoch of struggle where the nascent features of the new society will develop unevenly. The tendencies may even be reversed at times. Writing in 1875 with only the short-lived Paris Commune as an historical example of worker state power, Marx became cautious about the transition program. However, there were no further revolutionary seizures of power to put Marx's later views to test during his lifetime. It was with the October Revolution in 1917 that such an opportunity would finally arise. On the eve of the second anniversary of the Soviet power, Lenin expressed his views on the basic problems of the transition period. I quote again, This transition period cannot but be a period of struggle between moribund capitalism and nascent communism. In other words, between capitalism, which has been defeated but not destroyed, and communism, which has been born but which is still very feeble. The immediate struggles in the economic, political, and cultural spheres in Lenin's time depended, of course, on the peculiarities of capitalism in Russia and other even more backward regions in the Tsarist Russian Empire, and the conditions under which power passed from the hands of the bourgeoisie into those of the proletariat and the peasantry in 1917. The basic insight of Lenin about the existence of a period of protracted struggle after the political revolution has been amply demonstrated by all subsequent revolutions. What are the general features of these struggles? In the first place, there is the struggle over forms of property in means of production. 
The overthrow of the bourgeoisie or the landlords has not meant the immediate transition from capitalist and other class forms of property to direct social ownership of means of production as the predominant form. Yet, every revolution of the future must accomplish this sooner rather than later or else relinquish the task of transition to a classless society in all probability. This of course does not mean that there cannot be mixed property forms and relationships. As Hodgson, among others, has pointed out, basing himself upon the theory of cybernetics advanced by Ashby and others, we have to recognize the operation of the principle of impurity in any actual society. That is to say, in the actual institutional structure of property rights, many other forms than collective social ones, such as small producers with their own means of production, may continue. In other words, some small producers will definitely be allowed to produce and sell goods and services even as big capital is being socialized. The only proviso is that labor must not be exploited by the owners of such means of production. This can be guaranteed by setting limits to private appropriation of the surplus as well as regulation of work conditions and participation of the workers along with the small proprietor in making decisions. Secondly, there is the struggle over changing the relations of production. Changing the, the legal ownership of property does not by itself alter the real relationship between mental and manual labor, between the planning and executing of economic decisions, between the countryside and the city. The most stubborn all-around struggle has to be waged to transform these relationships which even after the victory of the proletariat initially remained stamped with the marks of a class society, stratified in almost all dimensions, including income, status, education, and the general level of culture. Lenin fully appreciated the importance and intensity of this type of struggle. Hence, the proviso against the exploitation of labor above regardless of the form of property relations during the entire transition period. The history of post-revolutionary societies, unfortunately, uh, really uh, does not bear out these insights. Uh, even in Lenin's own lifetime, he himself does not seem to have grasped the full significance of his own insights. Thus, he advocated the adoption of Taylorism in production uncritically, seemingly without realizing the oppressive and hierarchical relations of production on which the successful implementation of Taylorism depended. It should be noted here that such hierarchical production relations are ruled out by the qualitative labor theory of value as logically inconsistent with the project of overcoming capital. If these have to be maintained for some time because of hysteresis, they will have to be perceived as exactly what they are, deformations and historical drags, which, if left unchecked, will strengthen the tendencies towards the creation of alienation, deformation of culture, and ultimately creation of a privileged group that might even lead to a restoration of capitalism. Ironically, such restoration may even take place at a higher social productivity of labor. And both Marx and Lenin basically accepted a number of inequalities that exist under capitalism uh, by uh, appealing to uh, what might be called birthmarks of uh, early communism or lower stage of communism. Uh, in the critique of Gotha program, uh, in a famous paragraph, Marx declares, and I quote him, What we have to deal with here is a communist society, not as it has developed on its own foundations, but on the contrary, just as it emerges from capitalist society, which is thus, in every respect, economically, morally, 
and intellectually still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it emerges. Accordingly, the individual producer receives back from society after the deductions have been made exactly what he has given to it. What he has given to it is his individual quantum of labor. For example, the social working day consists of the sum of the individual hours of work. The individual labor time of the individual producer is that part of the social working day contributed by him, his share in it. He receives a certificate from society that he has furnished such and such an amount of labor after deducting his labor for the common funds. And with this certificate, he draws from the social stock of means of consumption as much as the same amount of labor costs. The same amount of labor which he has given the society in one form, he receives back in another. Marx was not oblivious to the fact that the last sentence of this paragraph insists on the maintenance of bourgeois rights, exchange of equal values during this first stage of communism. Since an equal standard, namely labor, is being applied to unequal individuals, unequal by natural or social endowments, especially the latter, this equal right in form is in actuality also a right of inequality in its content. Notwithstanding these observations, Marx concluded that these were merely defects inevitable in the first stage during the transition. He even went so far as to declare that, I quote again, right can never be higher than the economic structure of society and its cultural development conditioned thereby, end of quote. This, interpreted narrowly, can very easily open the door to an economic determinist theory of transition similar to that advocated by the Soviet and more recently by the Chinese theorists today. Marx went on to explain that in a higher phase of communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and with it also the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished, after labor has become not only a means of life, but itself life's prime want, after the productive services have also increased with the all-around development of the individual and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and society inscribe on its banners from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. I have dwelt at length on this theme in Marx to emphasize that the post-revolutionary distribution policies in the Soviet Union and with some important exceptions in the People's Republic of China, as well as in other smaller post-revolutionary societies, did not, in the main, depart from Marx's classic prescription. So, uh, what really is at stake here? Well, we um, uh, can reopen uh, the question of egalitarian distribution in light of the ultimate goals of proletarian revolutions. What is the ultimate goal? The elimination of all classes, all the relations of production on which they rest, all the ideas emanating from these relations, and the establishment of ultimately a real classless society worldwide. It will turn out that the qualitative labor theory of value has some surprising implications that contrast sharply with the theory and practice of socialism in the 20th century. I begin from the theoretical position that the question of distribution, important as it is, cannot be divorced from the question of production and production relations in particular. This is true for two reasons. First, Egalitarian distribution has to be understood not as equality of incomes, but as equality of capabilities. Marx was correct to observe that given existing inequalities of laboring capacities and the difference in needs that are partly but not totally connected to these inequalities, the right to equal income would in fact be a right to inequality. 
Yet, if the ultimate goal is to improve the actual capacities and equalize the positive freedom of achieving the kind of life one has reasons for valuing positively as a human life, and if Gilbert is right in characterizing Marx as an eudaimonist, then Marx could very consistently uphold the equalizing of capabilities position. Martha Nussbaum has made a powerful case for interpreting sense capabilities approach as Aristotelian. Following the eudaimonist approach, I have argued consistently for recognizing the fully social character of capabilities and introduced the term social capabilities to underline such recognition. This approach implies, among other things, that social, political, and economic institutional structure must fit the equalizing of capabilities objective in reality. Therefore, there is also a realist ontological assumption behind this social capabilities perspective. Human needs and wants will dialectically shape and be shaped by the institutions of freedom. A proletarian revolution merely creates ontologically and historically the possibilities for furthering this project. Second, and more importantly, related to this point is the more directly value theoretic one that if a classless society is to come about, the value form must be made unnecessary. The point of view that suggests that maintaining the right to inequalities in order to increase production so that inequalities can be reduced farther in the distant future suffers from a peculiar type of economic determinism. Such a stance taken frequently by theorists of post-revolutionary societies has ultimately legitimized exploitation in the sense of domination of workers in production by the management and the party hierarchy. Robbing the rank and file workers of political autonomy for the kind of equalizing moves that are postulated by the theory of socialism as a transitional strategy. If the goal of abolishing wage labor remains far in the future after society has become wealthy enough, and how much wealth is enough? Paradoxically, the socialist project begins to assume more and more a utopian character. This kind of thinking has led to the Chinese theoreticians to postulate a long stage of socialism during which the productive capacity of the economy expands. However, as the actual production and distribution relations become almost classically capitalist, such theoretical moves look more and more like pious hope, rather than scientific modifications of an approximately true theory in light of existing facts and historical experiences. Our theory would read the evidence from China correctly as transition away from even socialism to a more explicitly profit and inequalities driven capitalism. This theory would also suggest moves to institute policies for equalizing social capabilities immediately. The implications of our theory are not simply or even primarily economic. Rather, seeing the value form as domination at the workplace and all over society in the ideological structures uh, uh, that permeate society uh, that Althusser quite uh, uh, correctly has called ideological state apparatuses, but in addition we should see ideological civil society apparatuses as uh, uh, equally and pervasively uh, dominating uh, institutions in uh, capitalist society. So here the workers and their allies must struggle to overcome this repressive state form and the other institutions and culture that sustain it as well. Therefore, consistent with Marx's observations in 1850, our theory implies an all-around struggle against capital as an ensemble of economic social, political, and cultural relations, all of which 
are important and all of which work together to reinforce one another and reinforce social relations of oppression. If this argument is valid, it can also throw further light on the more radical varieties of post-structuralist and postmodern thought. While there are epistemological confusions and inconsistencies that sometimes push many of these thinkers to nihilism, the ethical core of thinkers such as Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, and Guattari can be understood as a legitimate revolt against domination and injustice. The molecular revolution that Guattari in particular advocates and the danger that Foucault embraces are stances consistent with our theory. An elaborate schema of overcoming domination flowing from this theory would include these and other positions for empowering the multitude, the term used by Hart and Negri, and the proposal for deep democracy that I have presented elsewhere and other similar proposals would mobilize democratic theory in this direction. Democratic internationalism from below will necessarily have to be an integral part of such democratic movements globally. And therefore, to globalization from above, we can counterpose a movement that is globalization from below. Thus, the distinction between the two types of labor theory of value carry some surprising consequences. The old academic project of theorizing the determination of prices is not seen as particularly relevant to the overall project of human emancipation. In terms of philosophy of science, a critical realist perspective would characterize the quantitative approach as ignoring the deeper structures and relations that constitute capital as a social relation. By the same token, a realist philosophy of science would also uphold the value of the qualitative labor theory of value as a deep structural, social, and political economic theory that uncovers relations of domination and exploitation first at the point of production, but then can extend these relations in a consistently realist manner to other social dimensions as well. In doing so, it also extends the explanatory range and depth of theory. Consistent with Marx's lifelong project, our theory establishes itself as a realist and emancipatory theory of revolutionary practice. What is perhaps even more important is that this interpretation of value theory resonates strongly with overtones of revolts by ordinary people in our time. Thus, an adherent of our theory could strongly and more coherently endorse Foucault's defense of the right to revolt in his lyrical essay, An Utile de Souleve. There is no right to say, Foucault says, revolt for me, a final liberation is coming for everyone. But I do not agree with someone who says it is useless to revolt. It will always come to the same thing. One does not make the law for the person who risks his life before power. Is there or is there not a reason to revolt? The qualitative approach to the labor theory of value replies to Foucault's question with a joyous, life-affirming, yea-saying response, a strong and vibrant shout from the street, yes, there is a reason to revolt against alienation and domination. Even more importantly, as Foucault increasingly seemed to have realized in the context of his later work on subjectivity, our theory justifies a realist ontology of free labor as uncoerced activity that will create a new human species beyond the narrow horizons of modern competitive capitalism and bureaucratic socialism. A new type of creative, active, free social individual through processes that are completely imminent. Thank you.